Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good day. I'm Mike Violette with American Certification Body and Washington Laboratories. And I'd like to welcome you to today's webinars where we'll explore a summary of some of the requirements for electrical approvals, radio approvals, EMC approvals in New Zealand and Australia. But first, uh, I want to say happy Valentine's Day to all of you who love compliance. I hope you have a great day. A few notes here, some webinar info and tips. Uh, you can view the full screen if you go up to the view file on the WebEx tool. We are recording this event, so if uh, you want to revisit something later on, a link will be sent around to all the attendees. We'll also issue a training certificate to everybody who attends. This will be an electronic certificate that you can print out and put in your training records. If you have questions in the lower right hand corner, there's a chat box. You can uh, send me a chat or do the Q&A or send any comments that you have on the presentation. We'd love to hear from you. I do want to reach out and say, have a special thanks to EMC Technologies, our colleagues in Australia. They have office head office in Melbourne, also office in New Zealand. And Chris Zambolis is my friend down there and he supplied much of the information that I will present today. So shout out to Chris. Uh, he also can op uh, operate as an authorized representative for you, which we'll talk about in some of the ensuing slides. Here's today's agenda. We'll be talking about general requirements for electrical equipment, ACMA, regulations, different labeling requirements, and the records keeping that must be kept for these devices. We'll also cover electrical safety requirements, labeling notices, and go over the requirements for wireless radio equipment for various radio communications regulations and short range devices. We'll also cover network approvals, which are traditionally for carrier and telecoms equipment. And finally, we'll cover some of the RF human exposure requirements for electronics devices in the land down under. First, the regulator is the Australian Communications and Media Authority. They have a similar role as the FCC and they control uh, regulations for radio, wireless, broadcasting, internet, and other media. They also regulate EMC and electromagnetic force, or EMF, or R exposure, they call it down there. <clears throat> they do not regulate electrical safety except for telecom connected devices, things that might connect to the publicly switched telephone network, or PSDN. On the safety side, the state governments all have authority over electrical safety. And the Electrical Regulatory Authorities Council, or ERAC, includes all of the states, the provinces of uh, the territories of Australia and New Zealand regulators. We'll get into some of these details in this webinar. For the general requirements, a relatively new mark has been issued since 2016 called the Regulatory Compliance Marker, RCM. And this really combined a couple of different marks and made a simplified project uh, process for labeling equipment that must be comply with these requirements. Similar to the FCC, I mean the CE marking, the RCM applies when a device meets all the applicable requirements that must be met for that particular device. So it's a simplified process. If you are applying an RCM, you must first register online using the Electrical Equipment Safety System, the EESS National Registration Database. This is administered by the ERAC. It's also jointly used by ACMA and ERAC and the Radio Spectrum Management uh, Authorities in New Zealand. So the ERAC National Database can be found at that link. So prior to applying an RCM mark to your device, you or a uh, proper authorized agent must register on the uh, electrical equipment safe uh, database. The electrical safety regulators is ERAC, as I mentioned, and they also administer electrical efficiency standards. So current ACMA regulations regulate supply of products in Australia. It is illegal to sell a product that does not comply with the necessary ACMA regulations. The idea is to manage risks associated with the operation connection of end use. This includes health, safety, protection of interference uh, for emergency services, network integrity, and interoperability between uh, and connectivity of telephone equipment. 
So it's an all-encompassing um, stru structure that minimizes risks. It does not interact with or concern itself with quality or performance. This is similar to the FCC's approach where they're looking at protecting the integrity of the communications network, not necessarily interested in regulating the quality of products. The CE marking, however, has a different uh, bend to it, and it does, through its immunity requirements, does in, a set, in, in effect set a minimum quality performance of devices against electromagnetic phenomena. But here, it's up to the consumers to select the quality products. Now, under the ACMA RCM labeling regulations, there are four critical equipment categories or labeling regulations. One concerns itself with EMC, electromagnetic compatibility. One concerns itself with radio communications devices. One concerns itself with telecommunications devices. <clears throat> and the finally, final one concerns itself with health and safety against electromagnetic radiation or EMR as it's known in uh, the land down under. Now, in order to manage the risks, the categories of equipment are three. High risk devices, which means risk to interference or risk to health, may be a device described as group two ISM equipment in CISPR 11. Group two equipment is ISM equipment that intentionally produces radio frequency energy, such as a microwave oven or diathermy processes or that kind of device that may use electromagnetic uh, energy to treat or process material. A medium risk device is a device that's in the middle of high and low, and it must meet level two compliance. Most devices are considered medium risk, as we'll find out. A low risk device is must meet so-called level one compliance, and this might be a battery operated device, maybe something that doesn't have a radio transmitter, it's not a mobile phone, but perhaps a calculator or something that runs on a battery and has a very low risk to interference or health. Now for compliance level one and two or low and medium risk products, testing can be conducted by any testing body or an in-house testing laboratory. So it's a fairly liberal process and allows testing to be conducted out of Australia or in Australia at any test laboratory or manufacturer. However, compliance level three or high risk devices must be conducted by an accredited testing body or recognized testing authority. So again, a low risk device is battery operated, cannot operate from the external power supply, only from internal batteries. A test report is not essential but the product must always comply with the uh, regulations. The manufacturer and importer should keep a description of the device, sign a declaration of conformity or DOC, and the labeling is voluntary for EMC, but compliance records must still be kept by the manufacturer. In the middle, we have compliance level two or medium risk or high risk device. <clears throat> A uh, description of the device must be kept and a DOC and a test report or TCF. An accredited test report not mandatory for medium risk, but will be requested by ACMA if compliance is questioned. Explanatory documentation to be <clears throat> must be given to the users to make sure that the device is not installed in a way that could produce interference or otherwise make it non-compliant. For high-risk devices such as uh, Group 2 ISM equipment or devices that must comply with SAR requirements, the testing must be done to the applicable standard through an accredited test report from an accredited testing body, and it must be labeled with the RCM mark. So the simple steps, steps to comply is step one, you must go back to the applicable labeling notice or determine the category equipment which is early on in this presentation. Identify the applicable te technical standards, and they will be specified in the noticed and the testing requirements. Show the product complies, get a test report or other documentations. Complete a supplier's declaration of conformity and maintain those records in a file. <clears throat> 
You must also register as an ACMA supplier on a national database and must be an Australian resident or a company registered in Australia. Now, it is possible to use a local representative or agent, but they must be also ACMA re registered. And finally, before importing the product or upon importation, label the product with the RCM compliance mark. Now, I mentioned that the RCM is a simplified process because as of 1 March 2016, the RCM replaced, replaced the so-called CTIC and ATIC marks. ATIC marks. The CTIC mark was used to show compliance with EMC regulations and the ATIC compliance with the communications regulations. So it's a single compliance mark. It also <clears throat> it indicates that the product complies with all applicable ACMA and EREC standards and requirements. So it's up to the manufacturer, or importer, or distributor to understand what technical requirements would apply to the device. If you are required to have an RCM label, you must have it. You cannot ship a device without the RCM label if it must be labeled. It also is used by suppliers to indicate that you've met electrical safety requirements. And the list of the subject equipments is in this Australian New Zealand standard 4417.2. So if you're unsure of what your uh, equipment must comply with, you can refer to that standard and cross-reference that to the technical requirements and find the compliance strategy or route. Now the document that allows uh, uh, Australia and New Zealand to share some of these regulatory requirements is the TRAS Tasman MRA between Australia and New Zealand. So this began in 2001 which it allows that the RCM is recognized in both countries. And most of them are agreed to uh, use ADOPT, CISPR, IEC, European norms, and other emissions, uh, emissions uh, standards. And the MRA covers electrical safety, but does not cover telecom connected equipment or the radio cell network. So who's responsible for this uh, compliance? Well, you must have an agent or local representative or directly the manufacturer is authorized by the manufacturer to act in Australia as an agent. So they are permitted for ACMA compliance, but not permitted by ERAC for electrical safety regulations. So it's a different scheme there. So a separate agreement is required by ERAC However, an importer may nominate as a consultant their authorized representative for ERAC compliance. All this is done online by the importer on the ERAC site. So the supplier in Australia must establish compliance with the ACMA requirements by producing a test report or putting together a technical construction file or TCF. This is uh, some European styled language from uh, the EMC directive. Again, an accredited NADA ILAC requirement may not be mandatory for EMC, but may be requested. However, an accredited report is accepted as proof of compliance. For some wireless equipment, an accredited report is required. Again, you have to go cross-reference the requirements to your type of device to see if an accredited test lab is necessary. For example, a device, a mobile phone with SAR requirements always must be tested in an accredited laboratory. And these accredited laboratories may be located overseas in other countries, such as the United States that has a mutual recognition arrangement with the Australia and the US. So the suppliers must register on the database under the ACMA portal. You're not required to meet the ACMA labeling requirement for low less level one EMC products, but you have to keep the, you have to keep the records but you may do it voluntarily. Since March 1st, 2016, supplier code numbers for CTIC and ATEC are no longer permitted. New devices that are put on the market must comply and be labeled with the RCM. Records must be in English, maybe electronic, of course, must contain some description of the device. Test report is necessary, must contain a DOC, and nominate the authorized agent or importer. Must also keep a copy of the local rep agency agreement. So you must keep documents in Australia or be available 
in Australia by an agent or an importer. This is the sample DOC that's on the ACMA website. This is not necessary to submit this to ACMA, but you must fill this out and keep this with your records. This, by the way, is just the first page of a two-page document. I just pulled the first page up here just to show you what it looks like. So the RCM label, again, denotes compliance with all mandatory ERAC safety and ACMA standards that apply to the device. And these are based on mandatory standards. They can be Australia, New Zealand. They may be IEC, EN, CISPR. If those uh, IEC, EN, and CISPR standards or results meet the minimums for Australia. So often what we do is uh, cross-reference the Australia, New Zealand requirements to IEC, EN, or other similar uh, um, EMC requirements. So no immunity is required except maybe for medical, aviation, automotive, et cetera. So unlike the CE marking, there is not a suite of immunity tests that are required for RCM labeling. Now this is called so-called a protected symbol. So you must initially be registered as ACMA or ERAC supplier to use it. So step one is register. After you've satisfied all the other requirements, register on the uh, website, and then you can apply the RCM mark. So it's protected in a way. You can't be used without registration. So who applies the label? Well, if you're outside Australia, mark must be applied by the importer or an agent or a person who's authorized to apply the mark. Maybe the overseas manufacturer. So you can have the mark on the device once it enters uh, Australia or New Zealand. However, you must be pre-registered for that. In any event, the legal liability is always rests with the importer or supplier in Australia. So who signs the de declaration of conformity? Again, local supplier or importer, if they're authorized by the manufacturer or the manufacturer in Australia. <clears throat> The manufacturer overseas can sign the DOC, but the liability is still with the importer. The same goes for an agent or local rep. For, for ERAC requirements though, the importer or importer's consultant, consultant must be registered as the authorized representative on the ERAC database. So if you're using an agent in Australia, then you must they must first register on the database before they can be act as your authorized representative. So they're keeping, keeping track of people, basically keeping track of products that are entering the market in Australia, and making sure they comply with the necessary requirements. So if a standard change to a device, no retesting is required. As long as the device meets the earlier requirements and has been circulated in the market, you do not need to retest that device. So it's sort of grandfathered in. So the same, same standard applies for the market life of the product. <clears throat> now this is different from CE marking approach, wherein every device that goes on the market must comply with the applicable requirements at the time of importation. However, you must retest to a new standard if the product is modified. So if you're updating something, you have to research uh, up, updating the de design or production of a device or the, the development of a device, you must research the required standard at the time that you place that product back on the market in its modified form. So is CE mark acceptable? No, CE does not equal RCM. Now you can leverage some of the testing, but it's not necessary. It's not a direct replacement, neither for FCC nor VCCI or the Japanese requirements. So it's a standalone mark that you must uh, comply with all the applicable requirements before applying the RCM. Enforcement may be triggered by uh, random selection from the database by market authorities, uh, written complaint from a consumer. Uh, they may be identified at retail outlets or advertising material. If there's interference that's been detected to uh, broadcast services, for example, LED lighting has been notorious, at least in its early uh, deployment, to being very noisy. Uh, if there was a safety incident or hazardous items, and if a competitor tests and finds a non-compliant non-compliance in the device, they may notify Spectrum market authorities uh, to trigger an audit. In any events, the compliance records, which means your TCF, your test report, your DOC, 
all those uh, test test results um, must be available to the market authorities by within 10 days. And ERAC has investigative powers, which means that they can go further than just evaluating the device. They may look deeper into the records or the conduct of the manufacturer or the factory or the importer. So if there's a, a compliance problem seems to be inadequate, uh, ACMA may request the samples for the device and they must they will be tested at the supplier's expense. And they must provide to ACMA true copies of accredited test report for each sample, showing that the device complies with this standard. So the device is considered to comply if three out of four samples were tested and all were compliant if more than four samples were tested, at least 80% of the samples tested must be compliant according to the test re reports. So your test results will be checked against the actual uh, retested, audited samples. So some of the penalties that are enforced, uh, could be enforced is uh, taking the device off the market, uh, seizure, forfeiture, or compulsory recall can be immediate fines all the way up to prosecute, prosecution and uh, uh, imprison, imprisonment, which is a pretty extreme thing, um, but it is in, encoded into the regulations. Example of the penalties, well, you can have a supply of non-standard equipment. If you're an individual, it could be 13,000 Australian dollars, corporate 160. If you make false statements, that's another level of fines. Uh, say, sale without a label or label without compliance, another level of fines. Uh, if you're knowingly causing interference, such as operating a illegal radio station, you may have uh, jail time and fines. So this is a consumer law ar arrangement in the uh, Australian legal system. So the uh, supplier may be <clears throat> found guilty of a criminal offense. And the maximum fine is up to $220,000 for an individual or one over a million dollars for a corporation. And civil penalties may also apply. So there's two levels of uh, penalties in force here. Let's talk a little bit about the safety regulations between Australia and New Zealand. As I mentioned before, it's a unified system under ERAC. And the regulations are, the regulators are on a state and territory level. So there's six states in Australia, two territories, and we have New Zealand. The electrical safety regulators, uh, ERAC, is found at this web address. And they have something called prescribed items or otherwise known as declared items. So if you have to comply with the mandatory electrical safety, you must have accredited testing and report. And the testing must be per performed by a NADA or ILAC accredited test laboratory. Now, what ILAC is, is an international laboratory accreditation cooperation that says that uh, accreditation bodies in one country recognizes the re results in another body. So they must be accredited by a JAS ANSI certification body who issues a certificate of conformity. So a sample may be requested and applications are typically charged for accreditation. Now under the IECEE or certif certified body scheme, uh, reports may be acceptable. And this is a global scheme that allows safety results to be accepted across boundaries, as long as the device complies with Australian differences. So there's always some na national difference that may not fall under the general IECEE scheme. So a short list of prescribed or declared items are listed in this Australia, New Zealand 4417.2. And these are examples and include consumer devices, television sets, that kind of thing, domestic appliances, TV receivers, battery chargers, and et cetera. So there's a, a list there on this website. You can look at the complete list of prescribed or declared items. So this is where mandatory testing is required. Non-prescribed items are things that are not described, such as uh, con consumer, commercial, industrial, scientific, wireless, et cetera. Accredited testing is not mandatory. So if you're not on the list, you're a non-prescribed item. So check out that list before you decide which testing route you want to do. However, they must still meet the minimum safety standard. Uh, 
3820. And Australian difference testing is common. So there may be slight variations in the safety requirements, again, that you must address. So for pre prescribed items and the use of the RCM, you must put the RCM and be registered, as I've said before, as a responsible supplier and label after you've registered on the ERAC database. Non-prescribed items must be registered with ACMA as the responsible supplier, not necessary to register with ERAC. So if you're just looking at a device that must meet EMC, you would register with ACMA as a responsible supplier and apply the RCM. Note that the RCM is always the same no matter what. Again, it's, it's a little bit like the CE marking, it's notification that you comply with everything that applies to the device. Uh, some details on uh, labeling requirements. The RCM label must be at least three millimeters high, durable, not easily re removed and visible to uh, or easily accessible to the user. That's kind of a general label requirement that's across a lot of compliance schemes. So next, number next, we'll talk a little bit about the EMC regulations. Again, we talked about the labeling notices. This is the EMC or electromagnetic compatibility labeling notice. And it, it specifies the obligations for testing to the ACMA applicable standards, uh, what compliance records need to be kept, and the labeling. <clears throat> and the list of applicable EMC standards, it's pretty convenient because it includes most standards that are on the Euro European Union official journal list of CE marking EMC standards. So this is only emissions. Again, as I said, in Australia, for most devices, immunity is not requirements. And it typically includes versions of CISPR 11, 12, 14, also includes uh, European norm versions and also has uh, updated the CISPR requirements to CISPR 32 and 55032. Now for automotive devices, CISPR 25 is not mandatory, but typically aftermarket devices are generally tested to CISPR 32. There are a few exemptions for EMC only such as, let's say, other jurisdictions, such as devices like medical, automotive, et cetera. Uh, you don't need to comply with a prototype before, you know, pre-mass production. Uh, mill, mill type of equipment may be excluded. Uh, low power devices. Some of these are similar to the types of exclusions that are in the FCC Part 15 um, requirements. Next is a uh, talk about radio comms. The radio communications device compliance labeling notice is for radio uh, radio devices and applies to all wireless devices except cell and broadcasting. There are 15 applicable ACMA standards for different types of transmitters, and these are generally similar to the ETSI or EN standards. However, it's noted that the frequency and spectrum plan may be different between the European bodies uh, and, and Australia, and there are some bands that are allowed in and one jurisdiction that are not allowed in the other. So this is an unlicensed operation, no submittal to ACMA, no ACMA fees. Typically you keep a declaration of conformity, compliance rec records and RCM label. You have to register before you put the RCM label on there. I'll repeat that. However, you're not submitting for a certification or ACMA approval. So this is all de self-declaration. Uh, this link is uh, calls up 15 applicable standards, including uh, the kind of the normal short range devices, SRD, such as Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, et cetera, uh, push to talk transceivers, mobile transceivers, emergency be beacons, et cetera. Again, there's three compliance levels under the radio comms requirements, low, medium, and high risk. Similar as for the EMC labeling notice. So level one, you must have a description and a DOC. Test reports not mandatory, but must comply with the requirements, but the labeling is mandatory. Level two, you must have the same things as level one, but you have to have evidence of compliance or some kind of test report. Again, FCC or Etsy reports may be acceptable if the Australian requirements fall in line. Again, looking at cross-referencing between the FCC or Etsy requirements and uh, the Australian requirements is a useful exercise. <clears throat> 
Level three is the highest risk again. So you have to have a description, a declaration of conformity, and an accredited report. Again, you can use FCC and Etsy types of reports if they meet the Australian requirements. For SAR, our specific absorption rate for mobile devices, always level three and must be tested in an accredited laboratory. So some kind of requirements for short range devices. They operate on what's called a class license, really just it's an unlicensed device, but they call it a class license that prescribes the standards and may have other technical and operational parameters. But there's no certification, no registration, or no ACMA fees for the device. For 802.11 ABGN Bluetooth, they must comply with the ACMA RadioCom short range device standard 2014. This is just not likely to cause interference, but not protected from an interference similar to part 15 devices in the United States. For all transmitters, if the SAR is applicable, you would look at Australia, New Zealand 2772.2. The uh, short range device standard for Australia is uh, 4268. And it calls out uh, in part or in full um, some of the Etsy uh, 300, 220 type of requirements or 328 for Wi Fi in this list here. Uh, you may again be able to apply your Etsy standards um, uh, to meet the Australian requirements. For FCC Part 15.247 or digital transmission systems, gap testing may be required to meet 4268. So you got to lay the two requirements side by side to make sure that you fill in any additional Australian requirements that may not be under uh, 15.247 rules. Here's some uh, examples of low, low interference potential devices, class license, unlicensed, in other words, maximum IRP for these bands. Um, this is for hopping, hopping devices. Uh, this is, calls out the five gig band requirements. Another set of five, five gigahertz band requirements. Note that the 5600 to 5650 range is not permitted in Australia. So again, you got to line up the requirements. If you've already tested something uh, and assume that it meets Australian requirements, you should double check. Uh, this is the popular 900 megahertz band. However, note that 902 to 915 is not permitted in Australia. Uh, the full band in the United States is 902 to 928. So you got to make sure that you exclude those bands when you bring a device into Australia. So for radio comms, uh, this particular labeling notice is the telecoms labeling notice and it includes security systems, GPS trackers with publicly switched telephone network connections, uh, mobile phones, cordless phones, uh, PSDN phones. So this is kind of your classic network connection set of requirements. It also includes uh, hard connected devices such as fax machines and modems that connect to the uh, uh, conductively connect to the to the networks. For cellular devices, you have uh, requirements for connection to the air interface. This would be similar to perhaps the PTCRB uh, or <clears throat> And uh, SO42 is required for 2G and GPRS devices and all GSM equipment if you're still uh, using those, those uh, modulation and interface connections. There's other requirements for EMC for chargers, accessories, and car kits. Uh, for human exposure to RF, they call it electromagnetic radiation, SAR, and safety for power adapters and chargers. Uh, the link below shows a list of the requirements. Uh, it may be extra for accessories and other devices. So the final bit here we'll cover is uh, SAR requirements. So the fourth uh, labeling notice is uh, for compliance for electromagnetic radiation or EMR labeling notice. So same requirements as for EMC, you must register as an ACMA supplier to use the RCM mark again. You must have good record keeping and supporting documentation, testing reports. You have to have a accredited laboratory. You must meet the compliance levels. Uh, you must follow the labeling requirements if there's warnings. And you must issue a declaration of conformity or DOC signed in the proper way. <clears throat> 
So this standard, uh, radio communications EMR human exposure standard 2014, is known as the ACMA EMR standard. So it sets the limits for exposure to EMR from mobile devices that have an integral antenna. So ACMA is the uh, authoritative, uh, agent of, authoritative agency over there and pretty much specifies the ICNR limits. There are two different measurement methods. You could use a field method or a SAR method, or allows a assessment by computation using similar results or, or methods to the FCC maximum permissible exposure calculations. So again, depends on the device and the way it's used. If it's used near the body, you may need SAR. Um, <clears throat> if it's used uh, uh, at the ear, you have to use SAR. If you use it uh, more than 20 centimeters from the body, such as a portable device, you could make measurements using a field meter, or you could make measurements using a computation if you know the conducted power and the an antenna performance. So similar to the way the FCC sort of structures things, however, FCC reports are not acceptable. You must comply with the uh, applicable EN 6209-1 and-2 requirements. Labeling and compliance, you have the same kind of labeling, same as for RCM. You must register on the ERAC database, put together a SAR test report, have a description of the device, prepare a compliance folder, uh, DOC, apply the label. But there's no need to report the actual SAR information in the user's manual. So that sort of wraps things up uh, on my side here. We're uh, about 36 minutes into the presentation. Let me open up the chat box and see if uh, anybody has any questions that I might be able to help with. Well, I don't uh, see any uh, questions. If uh, anybody wants to message me after this or uh, has any burning questions that I can help you with, uh, feel free to send me uh, an email. My email is mikeb at wll.com. And as I mentioned before, we'll be sending a, a link to uh, all the participants, and I hope you have a very happy Valentine's Day. Thank you for joining our webinar.